your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Apria QC quarterly investors call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session for analyst and or investor firms only. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, please press the pound key. Thank you. Katie Turner, you may begin your conference. Thanks, Suzanne. Good morning, everyone. We appreciate you joining us to discuss a free of Inc. financial results for the second quarter ended November 30, 2019. On today's call are Erwin Seiden and Carl Murren. By now, everyone should have access to the earnings release, financial statements, MP&A, and investor presentation, which are available on the investor section of Afria's website at www.afriainc.com. The financial statements have been filed with Peter and Edgar. Before we begin, please remember that during the course of this call, management may make forward looking statements. These statements are based on management's current expectations and beliefs, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties, which may prove to be incorrect, and actual results could differ materially from those described in these forward looking statements. Please note that in the text of our earnings press release and financial filings issued today for a discussion of the risks and uncertainties associated with such forward looking statements. And now I'd like to turn the call over to Erwin Simon. Thank you, Katie. Good morning, everyone. We appreciate you joining us today to discuss our second quarter financial results. Our team has accomplished a lot on all fronts. Boy, what a difference a year makes. From enhancing our global team to our brand building activities, new facilities, grow production capabilities, to investing in new systems, technology, as well as involving our corporate governments. I enjoy working closely with our team, and it's great to remove the intern title. Together, we all appreciate the hard work and dedication that has propelled us forward and will continue our future success is on the horizon. But let's focus on Q2. A few key quarterly highlights include adult use cannabis net revenue increased 46%, and we nearly doubled our consolidated adjusted EBITDA as compared to the first quarter. Net cannabis revenue increased 9%, and we nearly tripled cannabis operations adjusted EBITDA from the prior quarter. We ended the quarter with one of the strongest cash positions in the industry, a strong balance sheet, $498 million of cash and cash equivalent to fuel our future growth in Canada, Germany, and South America. As I like to say, cash is king and we're proving it. We believe that as the cannabis industry continues to evolve globally, our balance sheet and financial flexibility will continue to further and differentiate us. We remain focused on the highest return priorities for growth. Our second quarter results demonstrate our emphasis on sustainable and profitable growth. At Afria, our entire team of more than 1,200 employees is intensely focused on growing our brands, profitability, our strong cash position for growth, and focusing on our core assets that we believe will create the most value as we invest in them to grow. This also includes the potential monetization of non-core assets, which will help to further streamline our business and reduce CapEx over time. Our mission is clear, to be a premier global cannabis company with our medical and adult use cannabis brands. We are building brands that we believe resonate with consumers today and well into the future, which I'll focus on in more detail in a minute. We created robust, in robust initiatives and clear goals for execution across function and emphasizing our core capabilities and further developing areas of our business to position us for sustainable growth. The level of accountability that we've enacted upon that delivers results, even as transitionary market dynamics impact the cannabis industry from time to time. We believe as dynamics improve for everyone in the industry, that Afria will continue to stand out as that leading cannabis company. 
Afria has a strong foundation, compelling business fundamentals and capabilities, which streamline operations process, upgrades and investments in technology that played a key role in our development with recent rollout of our new ERP systems and greater automation in our facilities. In Leamington, we are consistently working on generating higher yields at a lower cost and a low cost producer. At Afria One, our team has planted more than 600,000 plants. During Q2, Afria Diamond, our premier greenhouse featuring 1.3 million square feet of production, received its license from Health Canada. Since then, I'm proud to tell you, Afria Diamond is now 100% planted. And we expect the first full crop rotation in early February, with the first shipments of wholesale dried bud soon to follow. We look forward to sales from Afria Diamond commencing in Q4. We are excited about the tremendous growth opportunities we now have as a result of expanding our total annual domestic production capacity in Canada, as well as our strong medical and adult use brand sales and our GMP export and white label opportunities. We are pleased to have received confirmation of compliance with the requirements of the EU GMP from Malta Medicines Authority for the company's subsidiary, Avante RX Analytics. This license will allow a PREA to ship bulk and finished dry flour as well as bulk finished cannabis oil for medicinal use in permitted jurisdictions throughout the EU. At Afria, we strive to be better in all that we do as an industry leader. We recently finalized long-term multidisciplinary research partnership with the University of Saskatchewan and a cannabinoid research initiative of Saskatchewan to investigate novel and proprietary cannabinoid drug formulations. And we're pleased to see positive early results the host from the hospital gallons Argentinian trial with our free of medic oil, showing significant outcomes for the treatment of refractory epilepsy. We have compelling brands for patients and consumers across broad demographics. Today, Apria has five quality brands, including Soleil, Riff, Good Supply, Brocucos, and as I just mentioned, Apria, our medical brand. We are increasingly connecting with consumers for our medical and adult use brand positioning and innovation to drive growth. This is demonstrated by the following key brand highlight for the court. Our four adult use brands combined held the number one position in the oil and capsule categories, with Soleil representing the number one brand in the oil and capsule categories. In Ontario, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island, the only provinces sharing sufficient data to determine. For the month of November, Afria's adult use brands combined held the number one sales position for pre-roll, oil, and capsules, and the number three sales position for flour, as compared to other licensed producers. Afria brands represent 13.8% market share in Ontario for November. That's excluding capsules. This is the two-thirds greater than the next largest LP. As the cannabis industry continuously evolves globally, we're also evolving at a rapid pace to ensure our Priya stays ahead by leveraging our core capabilities. Our Priya success will continue to be driven by our differentiation portfolio of brands and products aimed at delighting distinct consumer segments. We believe the quality of our brands remains unmatched in this industry. Our entry into new product markets will be done in strategic and thoughtful manners where the best opportunities exist, differentiating us as we address patients and consumer needs at the forefront. This includes vapes, as I previously mentioned. We will have 34 new vape SKUs, many which are already in stores today including Soleil, Gather, Unplugged, Balance, Riff, Super Lemon Haze, Gene Guy, and GDP Sour Kush, Good Supply, Blue Dream, Pineapple Express. And we look forward to launching our edibles, teas, beverage, and topicals in the very near future.
Internationally, we are very pleased with our progress. At Free Air Remains, the only licensed producer in Germany, we're permission to grow in all three strains of medical cannabis approved by the German authority. We remain confident that not only the first harvest in Germany happened before the end of this fiscal year, but that our CO2 extraction capabilities will be ready in January 2021. We are also pleased to report our import and wholesale license for Germany has been received. In Colombia, a free partner with Federation Medical Colombia to host the first academic medical congress in Bogota, Colombia. The event welcomed more than 200 doctors from the country who participated in a full day of educational lectures by experts in the field. Speakers shared insights on the current state of cannabis in Colombia, the government's efforts in regulating the space, and patient case studies from, our, from Canada. In the U.S., we are focused on building strategic partnership and alliances for growth, with an emphasis on industries that aren't necessarily attached to, but rather complement cannabis until medical cannabis is fully legalized. We believe a free can generate strong growth in the U.S. over time. Over time, we continue to believe Afria will be a consumer packaged goods company. With that comes plenty of options for us in the U.S. and around the world. Afria is increasingly well positioned with the right team in the right global markets with the right strategic initiatives, production type capabilities, and capital to support our growth in fiscal 2020 and well into the future. We have a strong foundation in Canada where we expect momentum to accelerate in terms of both sales and profitability in the second half of fiscal 2020. This strong foundation helps us leverage key learnings, implement on market-specific basis in Germany and Latin America, as I said, including Colombia, Argentina, Paraguay, and Jamaica, as well as other international markets. Together, the team at Afria has a not entrepreneurial, nimble culture that is grounded in capability and accountabilities. We believe the opportunities for long-term shareholder value creation are very strong. I'd like to thank my leadership team, my board and our associates around the world for all their help getting us to where we are today and their continued dedication to moving Afria forward. With that, I'd like to turn the call now over to Carl to take you through our Q2 financials. Thank you. Thank you, Erwin, and good morning. Please note, all financial references are in Canadian dollars, unless I mention otherwise. Given recent industry events, I want to highlight four key items from our results. These quarterly results include no impairments on subsidiaries, no inventory write down no provisions for future sales returns, and no sales returns on either adult use or medical cannabis. As Erwin discussed, in the second quarter, we continue to execute on our growth initiatives and prioritize profitability as we continue to position our business for long-term growth and success. We are pleased with our financial results, particularly our cannabis revenue growth, sequential positive adjusted EBITDA, and our ability to maintain a strong balance sheet and cash position. While recognizing the need to hasten the evolution of CC Pharma's business model, most importantly as it relates to sales levels, this demonstrates the strength of our team and the strategic initiatives we are working on together to execute every day at Afria. Our commitment to give back to both people and the planet continues. Afria launched its cannabis education program, Afria Educates in the quarter mandated to educate Canadian adults on responsible use of all cannabis products, legally available now and in the future. Afria Educates kicked off with a two-city panel tour in Toronto and Vancouver. Throughout the year, Afria will continue to provide both education and understanding where it makes sense to Canadians, helping them to better understand the ever-evolving cannabis landscape. Our sustainability benchmarking is underway and we are on track towards our commitment to report on our CSR and sustainability initiatives and practices after the end of this fiscal year. And finally, plant positivity. 
our social impact platform that champions plants and the incredible power they have in overall well-being, as well as looking to improve access to green spaces for communities. We have a number of exciting programs launching soon and look forward to expanding plant positivity in more cities across Canada this year. Our financial results demonstrate our ability to continue to gain share both in provinces reporting share figures and in provinces that have chosen not to share these figures. They demonstrate our continued focus on leveraging our cultivation experience into lower costs per gram and our focus on being and remaining adjusted EBITDA positive, both internally financed future growth initiatives and in the future being in a position to provide an annual return to our shareholders through dividends. Net revenue increased 457% over the prior year period to $120.6 million. Compared to the prior quarter, cannabis revenue increased 9% to $33.7 million from $30.8 million. Adult use net revenue increased 46% to $29 million. Distribution revenue, which was below our expectations for the quarter, decreased from 95.3 million to 86.4 million. The lower distribution revenue is associated with the change in the German government's medical reimbursement model, as I discussed last quarter, and normal business seasonality in CC Pharma. Going forward, we expect to see more normalized rates of growth in distribution revenue. Distribution revenue remains a key metric for our international team for the remainder of the year. Our team in Germany are preparing the business for importation of EU GMP certified cannabis from Canada. Facility additions are well on their way, and they already have pharmacies reaching out for pre-orders. In addition, the team continues to complete weekly practitioner-initiated training of pharmacists and doctors on all topics cannabis-related. We remain on track to harvest Germany's first domestically grown medical cannabis by the end of calendar 2020 from our new cultivation facility in New Minster. The entire Afria team in Germany is focused on positioning Afria with the most comprehensive license in the country as a dominating force in the German cannabis market. In Colombia, we are excited about the early results from Hospital Gatahan's epileptic seizure control study. Early results suggest a reduction in seizures for 80% of the participants, with 10% of the participants realizing a 100% decrease in seizures. On the heels of this positive result, we are seeing pre-registrations in Argentina for access to the new camp compassionate use laws. Here in Canada, we'd like to extend our congratulations to our partner, Tetra Biopharma, for receiving a favorable letter of advice from the FDA for quick sleep a botanical drug for chronic pain whose active ingredient is supplied by Afria. This allows Tetra to explore pain indications beyond cancer such as arthritic, neuropathic, chronic back pain, migraine, and fibromyalgia. With the potential to compete against first-line pain medications such as acetaminophen and NSAIDs, and possibly even second and third-line medications like Lyrica, Cymbalta, and opioids. The company sold 7,062 kilogram equivalents of cannabis, up 18% compared to 5,969 kilogram equivalents in the last quarter. Adult use cannabis accounted for 5,567 kilogram equivalents, and medical cannabis accounted for 1,237 kilogram equivalents. Further, dried flour represented 3,950 kilogram equivalents of this total with the remainder coming from cannabis derivatives. The average selling price of adult use cannabis before the excise tax decreased to 522 per gram compared to 602 per gram last quarter, primarily as a result of a shift in sales mix. The average selling price of medical cannabis, exclusive of wholesale and before the excise tax, increased to $8.16 per gram compared to 7.56 last quarter, primarily related to a higher percentage of total medical sales coming from Broken Coast this quarter. During the quarter, 
our cash cost per gram decreased from $1.43 to $1.11. Our all-in cost per gram decreased from $2.52 a gram to $1.98 a gram. We continue to work to lower these amounts and await the impact of a free assignment expected lower cost per gram on our consolidated results. Adjusted cannabis gross profit increased to $19.1 million from $15.3 million as a combined result of increased sales, reduced wholesale sales, and a reduction in costs. Adjusted cannabis gross margin was 56.6% compared to 49.8%. The increase was primarily due to no wholesale sales to other licensed producers during the quarter, as well as reduced cultivation costs in the quarter. Adjusted distribution gross profit decreased slightly to $11 million from $12.2 million. Adjusted distribution gross margin decreased slightly to 12.7% compared to 12.8%. SGA, SGNA costs increased approximately $7.8 million compared to the prior quarter. The increase in SGNA was primarily related to a $2.6 million increase in share based compensation and a $4.4 million increase in selling, marketing, and promotion costs, primarily associated with variable costs tied to sales. We reported a net loss of $7.9 million, or a loss of $0.03 cents per share, compared to net income of $16.4 million, or $0.07 cents per share in the prior quarter, and net income of $54.8 million, or $0.22 cents per share in Q2 last year. In an industry full of cash burns and heavy adjusted EBITDA losses, our focus remains on generating positive EBITDA. For the quarter, we are pleased to continue our trend and report a third consecutive quarter of positive adjusted EBITDA. The consolidated adjusted EBITDA in the second quarter almost doubled to $1.9 million based on adjusted EBITDA from cannabis operations of $3.4 million and adjusted EBITDA from distribution operations of $2.1 million, but were partially offset by an adjusted EBITDA loss from businesses under development of $3.5 million. Most notably, adjusted EBITDA from cannabis operations almost tripled, and the adjusted EBITDA loss from business under development decreased by almost 20% in the quarter. The increase in adjusted EBITDA is primarily attributable to increased sales in the company's cannabis business. Moving to liquidity, we continue to possess an industry enviable balance sheet, including a strong cash position, an appropriate capital structure for our industry, and a cap table with minimal potential dilution. As of November 30, 2019, the company had cash of $497.7 million to fund planned Canadian and international growth. This amount is more than sufficient to fund previously announced CapEx, working capital, and strategic investments. Out of the almost $5 million, $500 million in cash, we anticipate utilizing $45 million to complete German CapEx initiatives. $50 million to complete Colombian CapEx initiatives. $10 million to complete the installation of butane and other extraction capabilities in Canada. And between $50 and $60 million to fund the working capital increases associated with a free of diamonds ramp up. Leaving between $300 and $350 million plus the cash generated from future operations all of which is available for future strategic initiatives. More than sufficient to take advantage of any attractive but distressed asset sales in Canada, U.S. expansion, or other income statement accretive opportunities. In the second quarter, the company increased its cash position by approximately $30 million. Cash outflows in the quarter included approximately $36 million for investments in working capital, $27 million in CapEx, and a $4 million OpEx firm. Last quarter, we commented that our anticipated CapEx would be $20 to $25 million, which is consistent with what we reported for Q2. 
and we expected investments in working capital to be $15 to $20 million. The incremental investment in working capital in the quarter related to higher inventory as we transitioned to cannabis 2.0. Offsetting these items was our $80 million debt financing, $16 million related to the divestiture of non-core investments, $4 million related to warrant and option exercises, and $2.5 million in borrowings on Germany's line of credit. Turning to our outlook for fiscal 2020, with a little over four months left in our fiscal year. While we firmly believed in our original guidance, certain market dynamics have evolved relative to our initial expectations, particularly in the last 30 days. While there were a number of positive industry events in the quarter that speak to growth opportunities, those opportunities will only present themselves after the end of our fiscal year, including the change in the province of Ontario's retail rollout and the expected normalizing of store counts against Ontario's population. Resolution of Alberta's temporary ban on vapes and recent, recent initiatives within the FDA to advance cannabis to first, second, and third line therapies. Despite these positives, three key items more directly impact the FRIA in the second half of its fiscal year, including the continued delay in opening the 40 expected retail locations awarded by Ontario and their lottery late last summer. The temporary banning of vape products in the province of Alberta, while it studies the impact of vape products, with resolution on the temporary ban not expected until very late in April. The additional costs associated with using third-party purchased cannabis to meet current market demands for our brands as opposed to the internal cultivation costs if receipt of a free of diamonds license had not been delayed. And a delay in the growth of CC Pharma's distribution business from recent changes to the German government's medical reimbursement model. As such, we now expect fiscal year 2020 net revenue of approximately 575 million to 625 million, with distribution revenue representing slightly more than half of the total net revenue a decrease of approximately $75 million, and adjusted EBITDA of approximately $35 to $42 million, a figure expected to lead the Canadian cannabis industry. We look forward to generating an acceleration in our revenue and profit growth in the second half of the fiscal year, and continue to believe the Canadian international cannabis industry outlook remains robust. In summary, at Afria we have differentiated brands, product innovation, greenhouse space, cultivation expertise, extraction capacity, and automation technology to position us for success. As we gain scale, we will gain efficiencies through our team's focus on further building our international distribution for our medical and adult use cannabis. We are pleased with our financial results this quarter, and we continue to execute on our strategic priorities to be a stronger, more profitable company. Afria has a long runway of growth ahead, and we are confident in our ability to create long-term shareholder value. That concludes our formal remarks. Erwin and I are now available for your questions. Suzanne, back to you. And thank you. Just a reminder, save question sessions. If it's star one on your telephone keypad, you'd like to ask a question. Please pause for a moment while I compile a Q&A roster. Our first question comes from Lana Elwood Bennett of Jeffrey. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Good morning, guys. Hope all well. Good morning. Morning. Um, yeah, just a couple of questions, please. Um, first of all, can you give a number of factors leading to the sales downgrade? And um, could you maybe just put some actual numbers on these um, versus initial expectations and actually which of these were most impactful? Uh, and then secondly, could you just give a bit more comment? Um, around the shift in sales mix impacting the average price in rep in the quarter. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, thanks, so So just in terms of uh, in, in terms of the guidance, um, we laid out a, we laid out an order in the in the discussion, and so I think the biggest item was the impact of the change in the store counts or the lack of change in store counts in Ontario. 
those 40 additional stores that were supposed to be open sometime in the late fall and now don't look like they're going to get open until you know, March, maybe late April. Um, that certainly had the biggest impact. Uh, the uh, province of Alberta's temporary ban was, was next in order of priority. Um, and then the last piece related more to uh, the purchase cannabis in the quarter due to the, the delay in a free of diamonds license uh, previously. With respect to sales mix in the quarter, uh, we saw a, a greater increase um, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the brand mix itself. Uh, and so we see higher prices per gram in, in Soleil and, and Ref and slightly lower prices in Good Supply and there was a little bit more volume on Good Supply in the quarter. Okay, cool. Thanks very much. Thank you. Hey, next question is line of Aaron Gray on the line of Cool Partners. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for the question and uh, Irma, congrats on the official title. Um, Thank you. So just wanted to you know, dive a little bit more into the average price per gram. So I can appreciate in terms of how it kind of declined sequentially, you know, given the increased volume for a good supply. But, you know, how do we expect that kind of going forward, you know, as you're going to have more mix from vape coming online and then with, you know, beverages and edibles in the very near future. And then also you made a comment on Advocate Diamond where I believe you referenced the wholesale market. Um, from sales coming from there in the fourth quarter. So should we expect kind of a lower price per gram there too to kind of have an impact? So just, you know, high level, how to think about that line and kind of going forward over the next couple quarters. Thank you. So I'll just, I'll take the question on um, the Afria Diamond and the wholesale piece first, just because I think there might have been uh, just a misunderstanding in terms of that comment. Afria Diamond's sole customer is Afria. And so all of the product coming from Afria Diamond moves on a, on a wholesale basis to Afria, and then Afria takes that product, does all of the packaging, branding, uh, product format conversion, and then sells it into the market. So, so no, we are not expecting a change in sales mix, price mix, average selling price, um, just as a result of Afria Diamond coming online. Um, any changes that happen within that will, would really be driven by a decision to, to lower prices, which is not a position we have taken. We continue to remain and see very strong sell through of our brands. Um, and it's really more just about that, the, the mix of which brand is, is uh, selling more in the quarter, which brand has, has, more, has more orders, when do, do shipments go out in it. And in the current quarter, we just we ended up shipping more good supply than we did uh, the other two brands. Or actually the other three brands, sorry, I'm forgetting Broken Coast, right? Okay, all right, thank you. Just one more quickly then. Um, just in terms of what drove the increase sequentially in sales and marketing, uh, I believe you said it was the increase associated with variable cost type sales. So is, should we expect that to be the new clip kind of going forward? Does that come back down? Uh, send a comment, that would be helpful. Thanks. Uh, it, it, it should be the new uh, norm as we roll out new products. We continuously invest in our brands and continuously you know, get new distribution out there. And as more and more retail stores open in Ontario, and more and more new products, whether it's our vapes, edibles, and that, we will continue to spend dollars to grow those brands and products. And, and it's working, which is key, because that's why you know our share increased in Ontario. And if you combine all our brands together, you see what our share is increasing. The other thing is, we continue to invest, you know, with our partners, Great North or Southern Glazers, as boots on the ground to get our distribution and to get our displays within the store. So um, we'll continue to invest at those levels. I right, agree. Thanks. That makes sense with the market share momentum. I'll jump back in the queue. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Brad Pendler of 8 Capital. Your line is open. Yeah, hi. Good morning. And thanks for taking my questions here. Um, uh, my first question was uh, with respect to uh, CC Pharma and, and the distribution revenue. Uh, two quarters ago, uh, the question came up about seasonality in that revenue, uh, and it was discussed that there isn't seasonality in that revenue. Now I see that's one of the factors in there, uh, in addition to the change in the reimbursement uh, structure in Germany. So I was just wondering uh, you know, what, what's changed um, from the previous discussion there, and, and how big are those impacts in seasonality? What, what points of the year might we see some of those impacts um, uh, as it goes on? Thanks. Uh, 
thanks, for, and so you know, we see we see some elements of, of of seasonality really in this quarter tied around uh, uh, the pre-orders leading up to uh, leading up to the the uh, December period. Um, that in in past years uh, that seasonality wasn't as pronounced as it uh, as it was this year, but the but by far the bigger of the two uh, items at CC Pharma is. Uh, the, the continued evolution of that business uh, as it um, scales properly for the, the change in the reimbursement model. We we believe that the the, the, the impact on revenues has has um, hit its trough, but uh, as uh, so to speak, at, at this point, and that future quarters we will see growth in that in that number as the business um, finishes that evolution. Okay, and, and I think that's very helpful. Sorry, go ahead. I, I think it's important to understand too. I mean, you know, there's a lot connected with CC Pharma in regards to the government there and uh, um, some of the regulations. So that's it's not so much seasonality; it's just you know how the government uh, uh, mandates some of this distribution. So it's not you know so much seasonality. Got it. Okay. And, and then just uh, uh, as a follow up, with respect to the comments made. Um, and the prepared remarks on the call, saying that uh, Diamond will have its first shipment out in uh, February. You know, as that relates to revenue growth and the cadence of that revenue growth and then tying into to the guidance here, is it, is it fair to assume that you know, the fiscal Q4 will have a quite a step up um, from the fiscal Q3? Just trying to assess the, ma the magnitude of how large that, that first shipment could actually be. Yes, that's fair. Okay, I'll get back in the queue. Thank you. Thanks, Brent. And your next question comes from the line of Brent Hundley of Seaport Capital. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, guys. Thank you. Um, Carl, something caught my ear on the um, potential monetization of non core assets. I think it was in Erwin's commentary. But um, can we just revisit that and maybe have you? put some type of, of quantitative factors around that comment or, or at the very least, um, you know, is, is that comment related to new management potentially looking to reverse some M&A decisions made by prior management? Can you, can you just color that a little bit for us? So I, I think first off, like non-core investments, you need to, you know, concentrate on long-term investments, Convertible notes, receivable, promissory notes sections of our financial statements. Um, so promissory notes was kind of note 14. Long-term investments is note 13, and the convertible notes receivable is, is note 11. I wouldn't say it is a change as it relates to M&A. That's that's uh, those two right. things are very very different. Okay. All right. Thanks for clarifying that. And then, Erwin, if I can just ask you something. Um, on on your U.S. focus um, and and your you know potential evolution there or, or market entrance there. So consumer CBD in the U.S. just seems increasingly uncertain with you know recent commentary from both the FDA and the USDA. Um, there was even a recent article in the journal, um, you know, kind of painting a picture that mainstream CBD companies are you know, potentially stepping back from their CBD development, um, whether that's true or not. As you guys evaluate your place in the U.S. market, um, you know, you, you talked about some, some complementary, complementary areas that you're looking at, and I can appreciate that, but given the backdrop here, is your position something that may have to increasingly wait in the U.S., or are your opportunities still front, center, and available? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so good question, and I think, you know, listen, um, Afria from the beginning always had a position. We're not going to jump into the U.S. with a lot of unknown up there, and last year when, you know, the Anchorage Canopy deal happened, you know, I came back and said it was like buying a lottery ticket. So um, we're, we're not going to go out there and jump into an unknown situation. But, you know, having a 25-year experience in the consumer packaged goods business, and something in the consumer area that would complement Afria and complement CBD or TAC when it did become legalized is something that we are looking at that would have you know strong sales, strong growth, and uh, strong EBITDA contribution that would fit within well with Afria. And there's nothing wrong.
along with diversifying, um, you know, from cannabis, but to diversify into consumer packaged goods products. What I said in my remarks, I want Afria to be a global consumer packaged goods business um, that has, you know, connection with the cannabis industry. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of John Benpower of CIBC. Your line is open. Hey, good morning. Um, I wanted to ask about the Alberta vaping ban or, or temporary ban. Um, you mentioned you expected to last through April. Uh, what, what conversations have you had with the province, and, and what's the province looking for in order to move forward? Um, at this point, I think they're just they're they're continue to collect information. Um, they've been a little bit tight-lipped on on the full details of it, but. Uh, they, they just want they want to take the right steps for for their consumers, and we just you know based on those conversations we feel that that's that's an April decision, not uh, not something that's going to happen you know in the next two three weeks. Okay, that's helpful. Um, on the 2.0 product and pricing, I don't expect you can share specific numbers, but um, just directionally, do you, do you expect these to be beneficial to price per gram or, or gram equivalent? margin given your, your numbers are already ahead of some competitors on those metrics and, and will we notice it more in Q3 or is it uh, more likely to be felt in Q4? Uh, I think you'll start to see it in Q3. Okay. And, and directionally versus your existing product set? Can you make it oh, sorry. Uh, directionally versus our existing product, yes, it, it, it will represent uh, outtakes. Okay. So thanks. And if I could sneak in one more about uh, inventory. I guess a two-part question. You've got a meaningful amount of inventory. I think it was about 10,000 kilos uh, of dry flour in hand. So just walk us through why uh, did you feel the need to buy from third parties? And, and then the second part of that, given the stagnant number of stores in Ontario, does that make you rethink the production strategy at Diamond uh, once once it is online? And, and do you feel you have too much inventory on hand, or is there a risk you'll have too much inventory on hand for the medium term? So I, you know, if you, if you if you look at our inventory, I think that you know one of the things you'll see is there's a, a bit of a, con con a concentration on oils and you know we are actively working on on managing all the inventory balances but that one in particular um, some of our balances on uh, saleable flour were, were lower and that was that was where the customer demand was in the quarter um, you know it's a little bit specific to strains um, and potencies and things like that and so we supplemented um, our production capabilities where there was uh, demand that we just didn't have the right specific inventory. Okay, that's all for me. Thank you. Thanks, John. And our next question comes from Matt Bonnelly of Canaccord. Your line is open. Yeah, good morning. Thanks for taking the questions. Just uh, two questions, one on the domestic Canada sales and then just some more clarification on, on the international. Uh, distribution. Just first, I'm wondering if you can provide any commentary um, on what your expectations are in the next six months or so, given the, the significant increase in, in dried cannabis flower inventory balances at wholesalers. So I think you had a pretty solid uh, pricing uh, relative to some of your peers at about 520 and change this quarter. Uh, what magnitude could we potentially expect of, of price erosion, particularly on the dried flower? Um, you know, I, I understand that the cannabis 2.0 will, will likely more than offset this, but I'm just trying to get my arms around how uh, significant commoditization might be in the next couple quarters here industry-wide. So I, I think uh, I think that any level of price compression is really going to be tied to you know brands themselves and people who haven't invested properly in their brands and who haven't developed their brands and don't have sell-through are going to experience far more. Uh, price compression than the people who uh, have have uh, thoroughly invested and thoroughly researched and developed good strong brands. Um, we continue to see very strong sell through of all of our brands. Um, very positive reviews online related to the brands. Uh, I, I don't foresee the same concerns with price compression that I think a number of our competitors do. Okay, great. And then just staying on the other side of the map. And, and sorry, to your question. Yeah. yeah, and just sort of staying on the, the, just the cannabis uh, or the domestic sales, um, can you give any sort of goal posting or, or how, how you feel the initial launch has gone uh, of, of the 2.0 products? I understand we're very, very nascent stages, but just 
you know, I know that retail is, is muted, and, and you gave some of the factors in, in your uh, in your press release and, and prepared remarks as to why guidance has come down. But just the general first sort of three or four weeks of Canada's 2.0 from a logistical standpoint, how that's going. Well, I think you've seen the big difference uh, for Canada's 2.0 versus 1.0 is is the different ordering patterns that the control boards have gone through. In, in Canada's 1.0, you know, it was more about, you know, I'll take whatever anyone's got. In Cannabis 2.0, it, it's been a more um, muted uh, initial purchases by the by the control boards. They're, they're trying things out. They're trying brands. They're trying to manage inventory levels, inventory levels inside of the control boards, inventory levels at stores. And so the idea is lower purchases, higher frequency, just changing the cadence of orders. Um, you know, and there have been some... I've read some articles where some places are are, are accordingly out of uh, stock and are you know doing more frequent reorders. It's, it's just it's just being handled differently this quarter this uh, this time. Great, thanks. And just last question for me on the international side. I um, just want to make sure I understand uh, the sort of ramp in in, in that uh, in that segment, um, considering your revised guidance. So. At about 50% of your revised guidance, that puts your international revenues at about 290 million. So you've already done about 180 in the first six months. So that delta of about 100, how is that going to come into the into the results over the next two quarters? Is it going to be a gradual decline? Because I imagine we're going to see more uh, substantial decreases in that segment uh, given your your new guidance. No, I, I would suggest that you're going to see. Uh, revenues that more or less mirror what they did this quarter in our international distribution business for each each of the remaining they'll continue to be the same yeah okay fair enough. thank you it's slightly more than half yeah gotcha okay thank you and just a reminder in order to ask a question simply press star the number one on your telephone keypad our next question comes from a lot of Pablo Zouad of Cantor Gerald your line is open Thank you. Good morning, Erwin and Carl. Look, I just want to uh, follow up on the, on the guidance question. I mean, obviously, based on the share price this morning, uh, the market doesn't like uh, the guidance that I have to say personally that I like it. Um, and what I want is, is clarity here. Uh, based on the numbers you've given, we are looking at cannabis sales uh, for the second half about 160 million to 110 versus 65 uh, in the first half. I mean, those are rough numbers, right? That's a meaningful step up in growth, 150 to 120 percent growth. Uh, you know, yes, you have confidence on those numbers, but can you just maybe give more granularity? Like, what do you think happens with the base business? Uh, what happens with 2.0? I mean, just so we can have more confidence on that big ramp up in sales that you're giving here. Any color will help, whether you know, merit or flat, 2.0. What percentage of that? You know, how diamond helps, and, and then just the base and the line business. And then the second so question is related to the go on, yeah, yes, yeah, I'll talk Thank you. Uh, so Pablo, hi, how are you? Nice to hear from you. Uh, I'll go with my piece first, um, and then I'll let Carl, you know, chime in here. But you know, why are you know we confident in, in what happened out there? There's a lot of things, you know, that were not in our control as Carl took it through. But I think with you know cannabis 2.0 and Role of, of the vape um, product line, um, we will, you know, hopefully roll out some edibles, in, you know, the latter part of the fourth quarter, um, and continuously additional stores opening up in Ontario and the rest of the country. Um, our GMP certification, which we have received um, over the last couple of days, which we'll be able to ship to the EU, um, and just the big thing is, you know, having supply here. And with the free of diamond coming on, and we'll be able to start, you know, shipping product in, in mid-February that we now have supply. So um, there is a real good plan in place. It's a real good integrated plan from a growth standpoint, from a process standpoint, from our marketing standpoint as we build our brands, and last but not least, is a whole rollout with our sales team and with Great North who helps us do this. Um, and you know, as you saw in our last quarter, in Ontario with 25 stores and more stores opening up, you know, we grew our share to over 13%. So that's why we feel good. Um, and as this, as this industry, you know, is in its infancy stages, there's lots to change. But uh, I got to tell you, we've really got a good measured account.
account of how we will achieve this guidance in the back half. The, the only thing I would really add to that, Pablo, is that um, you know our sales growth to date has been more limited by uh, our internal supply than by demand from individual consumers within our brands. Our, as I said earlier, our brands continue to just demonstrate very, very strong sell-through and significant levels of, of demand. And so we remain confident that with that additional demand, our ability to pick up additional share with, with the expected uh, you know, retail rollouts in Alberta and, and BC and some of the other provinces as it relates to this year and then going past this year, Ontario, uh, it all puts us in a position where we're extremely confident in that guidance. Uh, so thank you. And I just ask a follow up. So more from a market perspective, uh, you know, if you can talk about, you know, underlying trends. I mean, the September and October start trend data show flat sales sequentially month on month after double digit growth from the prior month. Um, you know, what happened in November, December? Do you have a sense of that? There's chatter in the market that there's explosive growth in the very, very low end of the market. And I wonder whether that's incremental, just bringing people from the illicit market, so that's not a problem, or whether it's really cannibalizing the other product. Just give more color in terms of what you see happening in, in, in the underlying market from a 1.0 perspective. Thanks. But, you know, from the market standpoint, um, and, you know, from a timing standpoint, um, as I said, we continuously see great demand out there. And uh, I think there was a lot of anticipation and build up in regards to Canada's 2.0 and rolling out our vapes. And um, we're one of the first ones to get out with them. And, uh, I, I, you know, I come back and say, is this here? Not much has changed from the share that we talked about in November. So uh, it's, it's robust. Listen, I think what happens is there is price out there and price always does matter. But one of the biggest things that we're seeing, Pablo, is this here. The consumer wants brands and quality. And that is the big thing. And ultimately, where is the consumer coming from? It's them coming from the illicit market and coming into buying products that they know they've gone through quality regulation and that. And that's what we feel very, very good about. And there's lots of plans in place that are free up how we continuously move consumers over from the illicit market into the regulated market. Thank you. Thank you. And there are no further questions in the queue at this time. I turn the call back to the presenters. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, again, um, a lot is happening at Afria, as you can see. Um, we're in an industry that's changing daily. And, you know, I was part of a natural organic food industry for 25 years and saw lots of change there. Very similar. I'm down at ICR meeting a lot of investors today. Um, and uh, it's exciting to talk about Afria. And as I sit back and look at Afria from a rec standpoint, from a medical standpoint, and as we sit back and look at our GMP certifications that we can sell, you know, uh, into the EU, as we sit and look at many multiple products and multiple things that we can do. What I will tell you, cannabis is something that's going to be around a long, long time in many, 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 many you know, multiple facets. Um, Afria today, having both a free of one and a free of diamond, having that supply, having that quality, and having that regulation. And yes, we're talking about REC only being you know, legalized in Canada today, but there's a lot we're learning from that that will help us roll out products around the world. Um, as I said, we have a very interesting and we're looking at multiple opportunities for the U.S., um, just not around CBD, uh, around other products that will complement cannabis and uh, you know that's something that we'll be focused on. So we have our brands, we have our people, we have a, our strategy, we have a strong balance sheet that will allow us to do this. And last but not least, you know, we look to go back and how do we return back to shareholders. So with that, everybody have a great day, and uh, thank you very much for your time.